Hey there, this is Seth Juarez from Channel 9 coming to you from Mad Torgerson's office. I was expecting like a really nice Persian rug or something because you're you so just, cultured. Yeah, right? Did you just call me Mad Torgerson? M Mads. Uh -huh. Did I say it right? <laughs> Look at him. He's such a... You know, one of the things I love doing is I like catching up with you because yep. the language C-sharp is a language that I've been using almost my entire career. Right when C-sharp came out, Ooh. I switched from VB even before C-sharp was done, and so I've been following it my, almost my entire career, and I, I love checking in with you to see how things are going. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Things are going good. So last time we spoke, we spoke about what's new in C-Sharp 7. Yes. And then you showed me how to actually do stuff in C-Sharp 7. I thought we'd spend some time today just sort of looking to the future, what's coming up. Sounds great to me. Yes. All right. So what's the new stuff that's coming up? Well, so um, we have, we've just, we shipped C-Sharp 7 in, in March time frame. And then uh, actually just a few days ago from when this is recorded, mm -hmm. uh, we shipped C Sharp 7.1. So we started having little point releases of um, where we drip in a few useful features here and there. But the, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the next major release of C Sharp, okay. where we, um, we sort of go for bigger features again, like mm -hmm. we've done in the past major releases. So um, there's a couple of different things that are on the docket. Right now, the, you know, the C Sharp design team, we meet uh, two times a week for two hours, and we kind of really drill down and try to, to get um, to the bottom of some, some big, difficult stuff. And one of the things I like about what we're looking at for C Sharp 8 is it's essentially a bunch of features I don't know if they have much in common if you look at them as features, but what they have in common is that they are addressing things that we have been trying to tackle or giving up on tackling for many, many releases. I see. And I, I'm still hopeful that we will actually get to uh, deal with most of them in this. So case. to be clear, for those that are watching, this is still in the planning stages. It's not going to come out next week or anything. That's absolutely true. Yes, okay. we, uh, some of the... Uh, some of the um, Features that will hopefully make it into C Sharp 8 are, are actually in active development right now. Okay. So we have prototypes. We showed a few prototypes, very preliminary prototypes, even uh, in public at conferences. But some of them are just on the drawing board. And even the ones that we have prototypes for are like very rough. I see. So, so is there still, like, for example, if someone's watching this and they're like, I really like that. Are they going to do that? Is there till, still time to do feedback and comments? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, and as always, we are designing in the open. Uh, every time we have a design meeting, I, um, within a few days, I go to my computer and I clean up the notes and I put them up on GitHub on the C-Sharp Lang repo under the .NET uh, organization. We'll put, link, we'll put links below so you can go Perfect. See and then uh, people can go there and see what did they discuss. You know, how stupid were they this time? You know, why don't they get it? You can kind of see the sausage being made, mm -hmm. uh, all those flip-flops and decisions and so on in real time. And then uh, see as, as stuff progresses. And that's a you know a perfect place, just an, uh, an open place for everyone to come in right. and leave their feedback. So let's talk about a couple of features, two or three. Why don't you name just two or three off the top of your head, and then we'll go into each one. That sounds good. Okay. So, uh, so the one that we're in right now, that's my, my brain is kind of steeped in right now, is what we call nullable reference types. OK. Um, which is about trying to uh, help you prevent null reference exceptions, okay. the most popular exception in the world. And, uh, isn't uh, it the billion dollar mistake? Or it's a billion know. dollar mistake, yeah, yeah. yes. So, uh, so I, I can show you a little bit of how um, that was Tony Hoare who, who famously coined the, the yeah. billion dollar mistake because he invented the null, right. the null pointer. And the way we kind of put it is we're going to give Tony half of his billion dollars back <laughs> uh, because <laughs> nice. we're not entirely solving the problem, but we're helping you uh, do a lot about it. So um, null reference? Null references. And second? Uh, async streams Okay. Is another thing I'll talk about. Sort of the next level of... You know, async was about eliminating callback hell for a lot of scenarios sure. because whenever you code with callbacks, whatever people say, you're going to have way too many bugs and um, inefficient code and uh, random things happening. Mm -hmm. Very hard to debug. And so async kind of eliminated that for a lot of scenarios, but where we didn't eliminate it is where you have like streams of asynchronous stuff going on, like uh, streams of events or data that beams at you in is chunks. It, is that or like whatever. reactive type stuff? It is very related to uh, the scenarios that people use Reactive for a lot. Okay. But Re Reactive is, again, sort of, it's rooted in callbacks, and we'll do something better. Cool. So next one. So we, we talked about nulls. We talked react uh, uh, streams, async streams, and what else? Right. And so uh, another one that we also have a prototype of is uh, default implementations and interfaces. Okay. So that's more like a, oh. it's a, it's a smaller feature. But what's interesting about it is that it's the first time in a long time that we're building a language feature that requires changes to the runtime. Oh. And so we kind of got together with the runtime team. We're like, let's do a feature together. And let's like, we haven't done that since generics. Right. Let's like roll out something together. Um, and we'll and see that how that works. That was C-sharp 2, right? Generic. Yeah, that's like a decade ago. Wow. So, uh, 
So it's interesting to warm up those muscles and maybe sort of a, we, we, it's a nice feature in and of itself. We also use it as sort of a spearhead for uh, how can we get into that game again of actually evolving the runtime and the language together rather than just doing compiler tricks on top of the existing runtime? All right, so we have, we have uh, nulls, we have async streams, we have interface defaults, is that what you call it? Yeah, default implementations and uh, interfaces. And, and we need a shorter name for it. Anything else? Uh, there's one more we can talk about if we get to it, okay. which is sort of extension everything. Like okay. take extension methods and do extension properties and extension static things and operators and stuff like that. All right, so let's go, also do. Okay. let's go through each of the four things. Yep. Let's start with yep. nulls. What are, we, so, what are we thinking of doing here? So um, we already have, for value types like int, we already have int and int question mark. Right. right? So we sort of have that built into the runtime and everything. Um, for, so those are distinct domains, and if, if you say the type int, it can't be null, and if you say the type int question mark, then you can't just use it as an int. You right. have to check that it's an int and... Um, you can do some static checking of, of null. Yeah, you kind of have to unpack it almost, right? right? Um, whereas for, just as of old, for reference types, it's all kind of muddled together. So if you have a string, um, a string s, it can be null, but you are also allowed to just say s dot length, for instance, without any checking. Right? This will and so, explode every And time. so this combination of allowing uh, reference types to be null, but also allowing you to dereference them, that's that's what gives that's the combination that gives you the explosions. Sure. So all the null reference exceptions come from the combination of allowing both of those two. Mm -hmm. And um, there are languages out there, even a few now in the mainstream, that are better at distinguishing between sort of expressing your intent, like you can for value types in C-sharp, being able to express your intent, is the reference type supposed, is this variable supposed to be null or not? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's essentially what the feature is about. So we're going to let you use this syntax on reference types as well. So I can say string question mark, and that means uh, a string that is supposed to be null. Not just that it can be null, but like it's intent. It's part of your model that this string is null. So you can have a method that returns string question mark that's, that says, you know, beware that I will sometimes return you a null. I see. Then um, on the other end of things, when you have one of these guys, a nullable reference, the compiler will then uh, be vigilant for you and prevent you from just uh, sort of indiscriminately dereferencing it. I see. So if you have... Um, if you have this sort of uh, line of code, the compiler will come in and say, here, it'll, we'll, the feature will, is, is essentially adding a bunch of warnings, just adding the syntax and then adding a bunch of warnings. So it will warn you that you're dereferencing um, something that might be null. Oh. And then, of course, there, there are various things you can do about it. One of the things you can do about it is to, is to check for null first. You can say, if s not equal to null, or you could Elvis operator, right? Yeah, so there are many things you can do. But if you start with this one, um, then the, the, the compiler will actually do a flow analysis. Like it, it, the compiler does flow analysis today for definite assignment. Uh -huh. and we'll plug into that analysis, and it'll actually track the value of variables, it, not the value itself, but whether it's null or not. So if you did a check to see that it wasn't null, then it knows that inside of the scope of this if, S is not going to be null, and it will remove the warning. Right. That's kind of that's kind of like the stuff that Anders was doing in TypeScript. Is it that is right? very related to what Anders is doing in TypeScript, and that is not accidental. Like I've <laughs> talked to Anders a lot about this. Feature. I see. And um, and a lot of their experience rolling it out is uh, is part of what we do. So um, so that's sort of the core of the feature. Um, the the combination of expressing your intent um, to be null and mm -hmm. then tracking. The reason why, like, there are other ways you could do this. Like, a lot of languages uh, use pattern matching, for instance, to distinguish whether something is null or not. Sure. And that introduces a new variable, maybe, that is then the non-null variant, if you were. Uh -huh. and, but it was important for us to make a feature that fits well with the code that people already have. Oh, I see. And so if you go through and say, that thing I've been writing all the time for the last five years, I'm not going to put a few question marks in where I intend things to be null then you want your existing null checking code to be recognized. That say, you want your ifs or your assignments into the variable or whatever, you want all that to count and make the compiler shut up, right? You don't want to have to use a new way of checking for null. We already have like seven different ways right. of checking for null. So, so, uh, so the idea is 
for the compiler to recognize in the vast majority of cases when you know it's not null, the compiler also knows it's not null and the warning's going to go away. I knew there are other ways, like the... Um, Sorry, I, my, the pedantry came out here. I had to remove the end curly bars. Oh, my compiler you. wasn't working. Thank you. Yeah, well, there was a red squiggle in your <laughs> yeah. brain there. Yeah, we don't have a red market today. No, I wish so we did. Yeah. So here's a question, because yeah. this is awesome. Mm -hmm. But what I'm thinking about is if, if I'm going, like say I already have a ton of code, mm -hmm. and I don't have this question mark in there, and there is the possibility of this being null, is this something I have to opt into when I'm in the compiler, or is it just going to give me a lot of error? I'm trying to understand. Yeah, that. So, so the part I didn't tell you about <laughs> yet is sort of the, so what if I don't put a, a question mark? Then um, our intent for the language, this is where it gets hard for the com with the sort of compatibility mm -hmm. aspect of it. If this is all like, if, if you add new annotations and you express um, new intent um, with new syntax that wasn't there before, you get new warnings, well, that's just a new feature. Yeah. But if you start giving warnings on existing code that was fine before, then that's a problem. And yeah. what we actually, we want to move to a world where actually not putting the question mark means you don't intend it to be null. And that's the question, right? Because and that exactly, and, with, and that's not exactly what's happening in current code bases. Right. So that's fine today, but we are going to. That was my uh, yeah. my internal yeah, compiler uh, triggering there. We are going to now offer you a warning on assigning null or putting null into things that do not say that they want to have null in. Oh, and I, I see and this. That this, part. That's cool. That part is like a breaking change, right? It's, you get a warning, it's only a warning, but still, yeah. a lot of people have warned as error. Or something. So that is sort of like, and that's sort of the whole point of the feature is to warn about, is to make you find existing bugs and make them go away, right? And the only way to find existing bugs is to actually give you some feedback on existing code it's in, in the shape of warnings, right? So by its very definition, this feature is going to Help you. It's going to help you by, but by breaking existing code. Now here's the thing. I saw that Anders explained this exact same mm -hmm. thing. I think it was last year, and he said he turned this on and he found errors in his own compiler yes. code for TypeScript. Yes. That he's like, oh, I would have never seen that. And so you're saying this is the kind of behavior that's going to happen yes. to Sharp. But you have, you're absolutely right. There has to be an opt-in. There has to be a place where you turn this on, uh -huh. because um, existing code will get new warnings. And, it, and m the good thing is most of those warnings are probably bugs in your code. Like sure. a, a big part of our design is to try to make sure that most of the warnings you get are actually legit. Um, but you might not want to deal with that right now. And we're, you, right. you might have tested your code, you might know better, or you might be shipping tomorrow and you don't have time to deal with your bugs. Right. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Or oversights, as yeah. we call them in my oh, oh, that's, okay. oversights. That's a nice one. Yeah. So what you're saying then is if, let's just say, for example, this string s, I did intend to be sometimes null. Yeah. To make the warning go away, you just put the question mark. Uh, yes, then you put the question mark. But that might lead to warnings in other places because you might now be using it um, in a way that's dangerous when you have null around. Which is so you're still pushing, good. pushing the warnings around until you fixed all your bugs. And then all the warnings have gone away. Oh, oversights. You were oversized. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's how you like it. So, so, it, so the idea is that this feature is going to, the, the outcome, once you made all the warnings go away without turning the feature off, uh -huh. the outcome is that your code has been strengthened and is that's very cool. explicitly dealing with all the places where things can be null, um, that, where you're dereferencing things that are supposed to sometimes be null without checking. And oh. so, so it's, a, it's a feature that comes with new challenges in terms of how do you roll that out and how right. do you turn it on and off and so on. But it's also, I think, very useful in that it directly improves the quality of your code. Awesome. So for this, then, there is an opt-in question mark for you to indicate, I do intend for this to be null sometimes. Mm -hmm. If you're moving from a code base that does not have this, it's an opt-in warning. Yes. And if it is a warning, then you should go and either question mark it and then see where else the warnings right. are, or you should explicitly say, no, this should never be null. Let's right. make sure that that's never null. Right. And we do anticipate that there's going to be a few places where, where the developer knows that a thing is not null, but the compiler can't figure it out. I see. It may be, you know, maybe you called to some helper method that checked it for you. Like I say, if not um, as uh, dot, you know the the terrible extension method is is null or empty? Yeah, is null or empty, right? Um, so if I call that one, then I as a developer know that 
if it's not that, then S is not null after this call. Yeah. But the compiler can't know that this method guarantees that, unless like we do some extra special uh, annotation magic on that method or whatnot. And so I just want to tell the compiler in this case, I know better. And the way you do that is what we lovingly, we have to rename this, we lovingly call the dammit operator. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, if you have something nullable that you know it's all right to dereference at this point, you can put the dammit operator <laughs> and, then, and then go and, uh, and get the length here. That's uh, awesome. It's like, I know better. Uh, and uh, and the compiler says, OK, right. your it's, funeral. It's, exactly. <laughs> if you, if you um, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> if it was null after all, then you took responsibility by putting that bang right there. Uh, I see. And so it's kind of nicely symmetric to the uh, question dot. Yeah. Right? It's like um, check for null or say I know it's not. Or, you know, it's, um, so I feel like this is a lot of responsibility for me. <laughs> Telling the compiler, look, I know better. Yeah, but hey, that's, a, that's essentially what you've been doing all your life, just without any syntax <sighs> to, to sort of express it. At least now you can search for it. Yeah. Um, and. Um, and you can sort of see it. That whoever maintains your code can see where you made that decision. Right. It's like, in that sense, it's very much like an explicit cast, right? You put something in your code to take responsibility. I see. OK, um, makes sense. This is cool. So, so that's nullable reference types for you. And that, like, we, the last month or so, we've been like, deeply, deeply enmeshed in that. Like, I'm, I dream about this at night currently. So. Well, that's awesome. I no, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sleep. All right, so the next thing then, so we talked about uh, a nullability. The next mm -hmm. thing was async streams, if I remember right. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about async streams. Okay. So, um, so with, just as a, as a quick reminder, right, with async, um, the idea is that you have things that we call tasks in uh -huh. .NET. Other people call them promises or futures or whatever so that are sort of a, a representation of a future result. And so an async method, um, async method might return task of int, and it does something. Get. Let's just stay with the lengths here. Get. I'm running out of your camera. No, no you're uh, good. You're still good? good? OK. Um, so let's not give it any parameters. That's right. <laughs> um, so it will do something in here where it returns an int uh, return x that you compute it somehow. And, and then whoever uses that will say await. OK, so that's nice. Um, it'll await the call. So it, you get the task back, and await is the magic in the language that um, we should call it get length async, but there's no room on the board. Sure, sure. Um, so you, you get the task back, and, and the, essentially what this lets you do is instead of, instead of taking that task and signing up a callback to it with the rest of the code, um, you just when you await it, and when it's finally ready, you just jump right back into your code, right where you are in the middle of, let's say, a for loop uh, that's inside of a try block that's inside of a finally. Right. That's, you know, so you kind of, um, all the difficulty of turning your code inside out that, that callbacks give, uh, lead to, you, you, you essentially eliminated those. Right. That's the magic of await. But it only works for those single results. So imagine now that you have, which is you know increasingly common in, in cloud, mobile, connected uh, situations, you have streams of stuff, right? Either because you, you go and ask a database, give me all your data, and it can't, you know, it can't send it all in one time. But also increasingly, things just are live streaming. Like sure. you keep getting data from a sensor in, in IoT scenarios. Uh, you get events from here and there. And, um, and those are also async, right? They arrive at certain intervals. Uh, but you want to process them in your own time. Right. Okay. You want to free up other, right. for and example, you, other computations. Right. And you may want to take one at a time and so on. And so the, the idea is to have a, a new abstraction that is essentially the, um, the asynchronous version of I enumerable. So like the yield operator for coroutines, but reactive kind of way. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. So, so, so imagine that you have I, we call it I async enumerable, which is in it. It's just like enumerable, except that when enumer, enumerable of t, except that when you move next on the enumerator for it, that's an async operation. That's move next async. OK? Oh, I see. 
Like this is, I do this, I do an I enumerables and do yield returns of integers all the time, yeah. which makes it look like I have this infinite list of things, right? And F Sharp's really good at this, yes. like lazy loading stuff. So you're saying this is a way of lazy loading enumerable of T, but in an async way to allow yes. execution. So you don't block on the next one being computed, like you would with move next. Um, uh, let's say, you, or say you use link over it or for each over mm -hmm. it, right? Then you, uh, you essentially block on getting the next value uh, if you sit in a for each loop and just eagerly suck them out. Mm -hmm. But it's very convenient to be able to write for each over them or to be able to use link queries over them. And so um, essentially, this is just a framework type, mm -hmm. but there's a language integration that lets you for each over these guys, just like you can a, a normal for each. If you're, if you're in an async setting and it's, uh, we haven't exactly settled on the syntax yet, but it might be it might be a wait for each or for each. A, let's just say for each a wait, for each a wait, and then just normal for each loop var of what? Let's say it's an I think of 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 um, strings, okay. right? Var s uh, in um, some object some of, stream. Yeah that we already declared that is an IA sync enumerable of string. Right. Okay. Now we have strings. Um, and the expansion of this for each will then await the next move ne the move next every oh, time around. I see. And this is cool because let's just say you're an old school Windows program, right? The UI thread would usually get locked in this if it's having to wait for things. This this what it will do is anytime it gets one of these things It'll wait for the next one, but then start processing the UI thread, for example, the message pump or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so, so it just does an ordinary await, if you will. But, it, but you get um, to use your, your usual language constructs to consume them with for each, for instance, mm -hmm. and to produce them with, um, with iterators, just like you talked about yield return. Uh -huh. right? So you can have an async, um, an as let's say we have an async method that returns iAsync enumerable of string that produces uh -huh. this guy. Um, that has, you know, yield returns in it. So it'll have yield return this or that. We'll have to do yield. Yeah, okay, I see. And so, it, so it's sort of, an, it's an async iterator. It combines async methods and iterator methods, I so see. that you can await inside of it and you can yield return inside of it. And um, whenever you yield return, whoever's for reaching it then gets the next value and, and, and uh, their await will trigger. And, and so, so many that are looking at this might say, this looks similar to like something like an observable or reactive extensions, yes. but it feels a little bit different. Where's the differences? Where the difference the is this is fundamentally a pull model. You okay. ask for things, you get them. Um, observables are fundamentally a push model. And uh, that means that whenever they have something, they will call the callbacks. Right. Oh, okay. And so they decide, the producer decides the timing of it and, and the, the thread that it gets consumed on. Whereas this is a pull model, you can bridge the two. Um, the, uh, pr one problem that the uh, observables has with the, have with a push model is that they might push too much. They might sort of, um, the, the consumer might be gorging on too much stuff yeah. because the, the, the um, callback gets called all the time. Choo -choo 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 -choo. And, um, and then uh, you, you kind of have to have a separate channel for, um, for doing um, back pressure, people call it, and uh -huh. so on. You kind of have to tell the producer, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm gorging here. Um, this is nice because the consumer says when they're ready for the next one, right? So it kind of has a, a notion of back pressure built in. Um, it, it happens on the consumer's schedule, no faster than the consumer can consume it. Of course, uh, also no faster than the producer can produce it uh -huh. because you, sometimes you're waiting for the next thing to come. But it's sort of like um, when everybody's ready, the next thing can go. And that's interesting, right? Because this, there's this state machine in the background that might be finishing something up. And then it's like, OK, I'm ready for this. Oh, it looks like it's there. I can go to the next one. Yes. Instead of like getting dos dosing yourself with, with right. observable things. Right. And now, um, of course, there's a lot of stuff that's using iObservable out there. And there's some elegant code that mm -hmm. combines iObservables very naturally. And so it's important also that we facilitate bridging the two. And uh -huh. you can, but you can do that in a library fashion. You think about um, bridging an I observable to an I enumerable, a push model to a pull model. Um, you, can, you essentially have to decide what policy to do that by. And that's actually very natural to build into an API, um, a bridging API, where you say, you know, when I move next, when I take the next one, 
I just get whichever was the latest, and I'm happy to miss some of the events that came while I was busy processing the previous one. I see. Or I want to buffer them up to 100 or as much as it takes. Or I want to uh, never get a buffered one and wait for the next one to come around. Right? You can sort of say your policy about how you want to consume what. Oh, so you're, you're like bridging an observable to an IAsync enumerable in order to make sure that yes. there's some kind of caching if you need to. Uh, yes. For example, if you have more than 1,000, it's like it's not really useful anymore, so start dumping right. them. That's interesting. So it'll be an API where you have different methods. Imagine calling different methods, maybe extension methods on iObservable mm -hmm. that pr all produce an, I an, an IAsync enumerable, but they do it in different ways. And you sort of make that choice when you get your enumerable, how do I want to consume it? Do I want to consume all of them? Do I want them all to be buffered? Do I want none to be buffered? Do I want one to be buffered? You know, you make that decision, the policy decision, um, when, you, when you bridge it. And, so, and you can even do that here, right? Virus in, let's say this is an iObservable, you say dot keep only latest. I see. Right? And then uh, things just sort of do the right thing based on that. And you have right there in the code, you have your policy decision about which elements you want to see and how, how you want to wait for that. And that's really interesting because some of the hardest code that I've ever had to write revolved around timing. Right. Timing things that I had no control over. And right. this is kind of a cool way to bridge both of those things. Right. All right, so we talked about nulls. We talked about uh, async enumerables. The next mm -hmm. thing we're going to talk about were defaults in interfaces. Is yes. That right? I think this is a quick one. Um, this is, to be honest, this is a feature that we're bo borrowing, stealing. <laughs> From, uh, from other mainstream languages that already have versions of this. Um, Java in particular is one of the, those features where they actually uh, did something before us. It does happen. Um, the idea, so the problem that this is addressing is that if you have an interface, um, uh, I um, do something, <laughs> I notify, whatever. Nice. Um, and it has, it has one method, which is, um, um, Something happened, right? Void uh, notify or something, mm -hmm. um, and people start implementing it. So I have a class that implements I notify, and now, if in the future, I want to evolve that interface, I want to put another m member on it that's useful. Then I can't because I'm breaking people who are already implementing it. Yeah, you have to make a new one that's I notify notify, you know, or I extra yes. notify. Or so you something. get into this whole like generational thing with interfaces. Oh, that's the old version. This is a new one, and and that gets nasty. And so, this is just a little trick to say that. Um, let's say this. I don't know. Notify all, right? Word notify all. Um, you want to add that later, um, and there's some kind of. I don't know, and I know a lot of things. Um, S here. Um, this feature lets you um, add other members to interfaces as long as they have a default implementation. Okay? Oh. So I can say that one will, you know, for each over all the S's and, and, and notify or whatever. Like I can implement it um, in terms of the other members of. Of the interface. And that's easy, right? Because it'd be just for each I in S notify. Yeah, S yeah. So, notify. yeah. So there'd be some way that you that you can implement it in terms of the other members of that interface. Um, and then if a class, then a class is free not to implement it themselves. Okay, and that just means so that means all the existing classes continue to work. They will just have the default implementation of the new member, which they will now exhibit when, or which their interface will now exhibit. And that's kind of cool because later, for example, if this class in the next version is like, okay, this is still working, we can still use the new API, but now we want to opt in to some other methods that we want to override or implement. Yeah, we can do this better, now let's do it. And you, so anytime, so anyone who sees the new version, they can just, they can implement all of the members if they want to. They're free to still not do it, uh -huh. <clears throat> but. What's the difference between this and an abstract class? Uh, well, the difference becomes less, right? Yeah. It, we're, we're sort of crossing a magic boundary now and putting source code in interfaces. And a lot of people object to that on principal grounds, and I can see why. And I, we, sort of on us to kind of keep it very limited. Uh -huh. um, there are several differences. Uh, interfaces, uh, there's multiple, you can implement multiple interfaces. Right. So we have multiple inheritance type yes. kind of things. Yes, and we do have to deal with the fact that multiple interfaces put default implementations on the same 
inherited member and the clashes. Oh, on. But that it, is crazy. But we, it's not actually that bad. And okay. Java has the same, and they deal with it, and we're going to deal with it the same way, which is, it, it turns out not to be much of a problem in, in reality. Um, and also, um, interfaces in C-sharp, you know, um, are different than many other languages in that when you implement an interface, you don't actually necessarily, the class doesn't necessarily have the members of the interface. Right. Okay. Only if you choose to implicitly implement and make right. them public. So, so that means that the class itself does not change what members it have. It has when you when you add a, add when you evolve the interface. Uh -huh. Right. It, the effect on the class itself is very minimal. It's only if you cast to the interface that the members become available and you can actually get at the default oh, implemented. Oh, I see. So I was confused there a little bit. So if you add another method to the interface and you have to implement it, if you're going to add it, that doesn't necessarily show up in the new class. Well, you, right, that was always the case with interfaces. Yeah. Right? Um, if, if the class chooses to have a, a private implementation of the notify method, uh, and what we call an explicit implementation, where it uh -huh. says, I notify dot, uh, dot notify. And you could right? make that private. I didn't know you could do that. You could make that private. Right, that's sort of the default behavior, actually. And it's only if you, if you do an implicit implementation and declare a public member on C that implements the interface, only then does C itself have a notify member. Well, what if you cast C as an I notify, does this cause an exception? No, then this shows up. Then, then if you cast C to I notify, then it has a notify member. But even if it's private on the class? Yeah, yes. Oh, interesting. That's how C Sharp works. I did not and learn something. Every you learned something new. And so it kind of makes the effect of this pretty minimal on, on the classes that implement the interface. I see. They don't, it doesn't, adding another member, unlike Java, adding another member to the interface doesn't add another member to the class. Okay. Because it never does. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of a cool thing. It's opt-in. For those that object mm -hmm. to it, just don't use it. Yeah. For those that find it helpful, use it. Right. The last one you talked about said actually have, has to modify the runtime a little bit. Is that what you said? Or the no, this is the one actually where oh, you have okay. to modify the runtime. Okay. Um, because the, the mechanics of the, the mechanics of finding that uh, implementation and executing it in runtime um, can't all be implemented by the compiler, right. um, and the, the runtime has to has to do a little bit of work there. So this is good. I, I like this. The last one you talked about was mm -hmm. extensions on everything. Extension everything, as we call it. Yeah. So so this is one that we haven't done. We you know we added extension methods in C sharp three. Yes. To, as part of the link package of features, mm -hmm. if you will. And back then, we only really needed methods. Yeah. We sort of could have used an extension property as well. Uh, there was the, uh, the famous count method as part of one of the link methods. That yeah. is, a, is a method, but maybe should have been a property. I see. Uh, but then again, maybe not, because it can be very slow. But um, we said, OK, methods only, that's fine. And that kind of led us down a syntactic path where that only worked for methods. Because right. the way you declare um, an extension is you have a static class, uh -huh. static class extensions, and then in here you define a static method, public static, public static, some method. Um, this object that oh, has yeah. the, the yeah that then has you know take variable or whatever it is. Um, the first parameter is always uh, this something. T, right? but the first yeah, the first one is always this yeah, yeah. this. Um, yeah, I know move of T, whatever. Um, so you can't really apply that. So that's just a static method with a special modifier. You can't really do that to a property. What's the first parameter of a property? Yeah, Properties well, don't have parameters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we could invent syntax for that. Well, it, it, and then, it's you know, itself so, a parameter to itself. <laughs> yeah, so it kind of um, it kind of gets ugly fast. And for that reason, we, we sort of backed away from, we had a serious attempt in C Sharp four to address this, and we ended up throwing it all out because the, uh, this, it didn't actually work for the scenario we were building it I for. So. But now we have, um, we had um, an intern who is now actually um, a member of the compiler team, uh, a very brilliant intern, um, implement an alternative syntax. So essentially the way to do it, and so we had a, have a nice internal prototype for it that makes us think we could maybe do this. So the idea is instead of, of this minimal um, hacking of existing syntax, we need to step back and come up with a new syntax for extension everything, including extension methods. 
And so what we what oh, we're know where this is going. so what we're thinking of is to have a new type declaration form that's called an extension. Let's just invent a syntax for it. Extension ext here. And then you put extends some or whatever, whatever class it extends. Like person. For extends example. person. Um, and then in here you just do member declarations like as if they were on person. Is it? Uh, so what's the difference between this and, because I remember before you could take two classes and separate them, the same, you could take the same class and separate them, right? A partial, is it? Partial class. Yeah, it's a partial class. Yes, yeah, so it does, it, it is a little reminiscent of that, but partial classes are actually, they have to be in the same assembly and they're actually merged at runtime. Like okay. a compiler just glues them okay, together. That it's makes sort of, sense. Think of it almost like, not, it's not entirely true, but it, you think of it as the source code just gets glued together before, before the compiler gets them. Here, this can, this can be on a type in a different assembly, and it doesn't actually modify the type. It, is, it does really work like extension methods do today, that the members live somewhere else. They live in a separate thing, oh, a see. separate type, um, even in the assembly that gets generated. But, but there will be thicker... Uh, syntactic sugar, so to speak, right? Where it's, um, if you want to have a method on person, you, you just put it as an instance method. You say public uh, um, int uh, whatever count fingers. Um, and that's the syntax now for an extension method. No this any, anywhere, right? But you can use, and you can use this keyword inside, to and that refers to the, to the person. instance of the person. Yes. Um, but then, of course, you could choose to instead make this an extension property now, where it's just the uh, it's number of fingers instead. And um, you can do a get and a set, and then you do a get and set and whatnot, right? So you just use the same syntax as you would have if you declared it inside a person. So here's the question: because notice uh -huh. that the, this number of fingers get and set are there private members of the extension class that you can keep track of? You see what I'm saying? Well, because let's just say for a person, mm -hmm. I don't know, let's just say you wanted to, now people wear hats in your assembly that they never wore hats before, and you have a collection of hats, right. get number of hats, there's no hats in the original person object, is it something that's going to be an extension? Right, so that's one of the, I think th we are not going to solve that, okay. right? The, the problem is adding state to the original object. We're not going to do that, so we're going to add things that do not rely on stay that, that do not rely on adding new state. Um, I see. Because th you get then you get into issues about how when is that state created? How do we keep track? We, you kind of need to have um, dictionaries floating around that, that yeah. sort of adds the. So if people want that, they can build it themselves, right? I can build a side table that keeps track of all the hats for all the people, and I can make a getter that looks up in that side table if I, I want see. to. But it's better that people do that themselves rather than the compiler does something too magical. Something that looks like it's a cheap field access, but really it looks up in a hash table somewhere. That, that doesn't seem like a good thing for the compiler to do. So, yeah. we, so if we do this feature, which there are many reasons why we might not, you know, we, we'll probably not add um, instance state. Actually, we, we're happy to add, um, um, to add static fields. So you, you, you could say static int. Um, but then that's like a, or you could put your dictionary in a static field inside of this because that we, we are generating a new type, and that type can hold the static members. And this is interesting because this is reminiscent of I, the the terminology just gave me. But in F sharp, for example, all very like for example, one of the ways of maintaining state functionally is to make sure once you set something, it stays the same way. Mm -hmm. Are you just trying to stay away from managing statefulness in these classes? Yeah, I mean that would be. That will be horrendous and not necessarily very efficient. It's something that people should choose to do themselves if they want okay. to. But um, once you have this, so I'm, I just introduced a static member, and you can introduce other static members, and they now extend the person class in the sense that you can say person dot that new thing, or you can imagine it being an operator. You could say um, public static um, operator plus, right? Public static uh, oh. person operator plus, blah, blah, blah. Um, and now, in scope of this thing, person now has a plus operator, or uh, that means marry or something, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, plus, I don't know. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, all kinds of, and including um, maybe um, uh, constructors as well. Right? Wow. So, so it, it has a lot of flexibility there. So and, this is cool. 
So that is cool. Um, we'll see if we get to it. I, I kind of want to. And there's one way that this could go, but this is absolutely crazy, and I don't think that we will get to it in C Sharp 8. But one thing you can imagine in the long run is to actually um, let have sort of extension interface implementation. So you could sort of say, well, person doesn't implement um, I employee or whatever in general. That's not it, the class just doesn't do that. They didn't know about I employee when they wrote the class. Oh, but wow. I could maybe say that it does implement I employee, um, and as long as I implement all the members of I employee in the extension, then I'm saying how person implements that interface. That's amazing. And that would be like super powerful. But it also, it's another thing that would require runtime changes and has all kinds of like corner case gotchas and all that. So, Interesting. So that's sort of like more on, a, on the radar for research into the future. But it's just nice to think that extension, everything kind of leads, gives us a way to move in that direction. And the interesting thing is that this allows you, for example, type ownership is very powerful in an assembly because then you can do stuff with it. Mm -hmm. But if you're importing an assembly and you don't have type ownership, there's only, you can only do with the things the right. things that they specified. This allows you to expand, for example. So let's say, for example, in my assembly, I use employees and they use people. This is a way for me to merge yes. functionality of two separate assemblies yes. by controlling the types. Yes, you can, you, you can essentially make an adapter um, mechanism through this. Well, this is cool. So we talked about four things. Mm -hmm. We talked about nullability. We talked about uh, async streams. Mm -hmm. We talked about uh, default implementations in interfaces, and then we talked about these extensions to in order to do uh, uh, what was it? What was a I forget the term extension everything. Extension. I, just, everything. I, just, yeah, I said yeah. the word, but I didn't do that. This is awesome. So where can people go to give feedback on what we just talked about? Uh, they can go to the best place to. Keep up on what we're doing and see our current plans, our milestones, our proposals is our GitHub site for C Sharp Language Design, which is called uh, .NET uh, C Sharp Lang. Awesome. And I'll, I'll put it below so everyone can see it. Excellent. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Thanks for dropping by. Thanks so much for watching. We're learning all about what we're going to be putting in C Sharp 8. If you have any comments, make sure to uh, submit them below or also go to the website that we just talked about. Thanks for watching. My name is Seth Juarez. This is Channel 9. We'll see you next time. Take care.